Here we go. Welcome everyone to The Sovereign Way. My name is Elizabeth and this is a thought experiment on devotion as we train our minds and our energy to hold sovereign poise in the midst of all the world's chaos. So let's spend this time together. If you're choosing to be here to arrive, let's spend this time together on a journey in mind. And at the end of this session, we will arrive at some destination. And my job is to formulate and deliver a landscape of words and ideas and vibration. And your job is to be present to what you see and making a sovereign choice about what you receive and what you release. Yes, you have accepted the mission. Okay, good. But first here is a disclaimer. Life is a mystery and all that we're ever trying to do with philosophy or art is to arrange our thoughts and feelings about who we are in this great big somewhere. And it might seem like a futile endeavor because we can never really put our finger on the whole truth. And every time we discover a new level of reality, an even deeper mystery opens up, creating this never ending call and response yearning as God lures us ever deeper into him. So in all manifest terms, all of philosophy and art is pointless. As the teacher in Ecclesiastes says, all knowledge, all wisdom, all formulation of spiritual understanding is utterly hevel, completely meaningless, just sand dunes in a sandstorm changing shape. But even if our attempt at spiritual understanding seems futile, which by the way is only futile for those invested in the temporal, because there is nonetheless a strange magic in this inquiry, because the moment we use our words, our paint, our photography, our song, our enterprise, our moving bodies, our organizing, our serving, our mechanics to formulate the discoveries of our inner landscape. We are weaving the eternal into the temporal and truth passes through the imaginations of your mind and becomes form and a scent of that God essence remains in that form as an energetic imprint in the very substance of life. And so love expands from within the body. So your painting, your business, your music, your philosophy becomes the form of God's body, his very manifest response to your everlasting question. I am here. And not only is your creation his response to you, but in your devotion, as you tend the gardens of your creation, then your artwork or your music or your business or your, or your words, you are the herald through these things. You are creating his response so that his love may be known by another. Now, of course, as a disciple of love, your work of art, is not just an ejaculation of your truth and imaginative creativity for others to just spit or swallow. It isn't so masculine. It entangles the observer. It brings them into a dance of belonging and it reignites in them the remembering that they too are temporal and eternal, human and divine. So, in devotion, therefore, in the mastery of devotion, you have moved out of the idea 
that your creations are your creations at all, because it's not about you anymore, but about who you are serving. And you tend to things now with precision, with respect, with purpose, and with harmony. And the result is always beautiful, but it isn't always pretty. Devotion needn't be a blissful orgasmic love story with my creator weaving beautiful strands of sunshine. Devotion survives the fires of hell because it is faith in embodied action. So you can lock devotion in a fiery furnace of stress and pressure and not a fine hair on its head will be singed. My husband Matt shared a story with me this morning about his shift last night as a restaurant manager um, on Memorial Day. It was crazy. Now as a restaurant manager, when things are quiet, you can be in devotion in your work. You can be slowly polishing the glasses. You can be tenderly pouring the coffee for the guests. You can be mopping the floor to make it clean for your patrons. You can be in devotion. But when things get slammed, there's no time for pretty. Because when we're stressed, the first things to go are beauty and tenderness. You're super slammed, quickly do the thing. But if the mastery of devotion is maintained, then that transcendental energy of God's loving response to your call is redirected into the mechanics of life. So Matt's restaurant got very, very busy last night on Memorial Sunday and everyone was stressed and mistakes were made and tempers flared and things were breaking and fights were breaking out and the system was backlogged and it was a hard day at work and it was not going perfectly at all. And nobody's thinking about the love of God or about the infinite beauty reflected in the surface of the drop of sweat dripping off Matt's nose. But at the end, they all bonded over a beer. We are struggling, but we are struggling together. We were there. I am here. And what's more, devotion needn't look like the whitest, clearest, highest vibration of purity either. You don't need to have exquisite crystal grids of selenite and rose quartz to set the energetic field for your devotion, although that is very lovely. In fact, one of my most sacred experiences was sitting by the fireplace in this dark and cozy lounge in my dad's local pub in the Falstaff in Derby on gramophone evening, listening to these elders share their stories, soaked, utterly drenched in many, many pints of beer, the air full of smoke from the fire and the smell of roasting chestnuts, deep red wallpaper and oak shelves covered in dusty pewter ornaments from across the ages, some woman drunkenly laughing too loud. And I was in a very, very dense vibration in a very, very holy vibration in his artwork. Are there strata of life that you are avoiding because you're afraid that they aren't holy enough? Are there realms of devotion calling you that you're resisting because you might get dirty? Ascension isn't just high, it's also very, very deep. Devotion, the highest spiritual truth in the deepest communion with the body of God, heralding the presence, I am here.
But even though your holy inquiry is always in the art that you create, there is indeed a real alchemy in your creativity. You are truly infusing substance with spirit, but that doesn't mean it's always received by the world. I had a rather traumatic experience with a priest when I was 13. And here's a little backstory to show why this moment in time stayed in my memory, why it mattered. Because to some, some might hear that story and go, well, that's not very traumatic, but I wanna share with you why it had such a resonance with me. Well, I've been in the inquiry into God since I was three, consciously since I was three. When I had my first transcendental experience, I was climbing up the staircase in my mum and dad's house on all fours, step by step. And I realized all of a sudden, that I was thinking. And on thinking this, I realized that I was thinking about thinking and that I was thinking about thinking about thinking about thinking. And I realized if I transcend all those layers of thinking, then I'm not thought. So who then? am I? And this was my first discovery of I am. And the inquiry began. So I asked my parents, I don't know how long after, but soon after I asked my parents if they believed in God. And my dad said yes. And my mum said no. And that was the first time I realized that they were two different people. They were thinking differently, they were interpreting differently, which meant that even my parents didn't know. So who the hell knows? Like, ah! And then, and by the way, my youngest daughter, Penelope, just the other day asked me, who is self? Since everyone is self, who is self? <laughs> and it brought it all back again. <laughs> Now, like Penelope, I had my first of several IQ tests when I was five, and my parents put me in school a year early. So being a little bit neurodivergent and thinking a little bit differently from others, I was compelled to ask questions and inquire down lines that my teachers and priests would rather I not. For example, I couldn't get it out of my mind. What would it be like for a two-dimensional character like Donald Duck to be kidnapped by a three-dimensional character like Donald Trump. He didn't exist then. Well, I mean, he did exist, but not for me. But what would it be like for a two-dimensional character to be hoisted, kidnapped out of the third dimension and plonked into the third dimension? Would Donald Duck still be a cartoon character? So would he vanish if he turned sideways? Or would he like, woof, like morph into a big three-dimensional large duck? What would happen? And my dad used diagrams to teach me about dimensionality to the extent that he could, right? But my physics teacher just rolled his eyes. He was like, this isn't, this isn't an inquiry, this isn't a question, this is ridiculous. But all this just to share with you how important this conversation is to me personally. It's in every ounce of who I am. It's in every ounce of what I do. I, Personally, I grew up in a little industrial town in Norway. So I'm a little English girl living in a small industrial town in Norway. And the religious options are, or I should say the spiritual options are, A, you believe in the cartoon character of God who's very, very friendly and magically helpful until you mess up and then you're punished in conscious torture for eternity because he loves you so much. or Option B, nothing. There's nothing. There is nothing. Creation is just a big, unlikely mistake, a small, transient party of sentience in the middle of an eternal void. So those are your options, what do you choose? Well, I wasn't satisfied with my options because I knew something, like I knew something inside of me, but what was it? 
I didn't have the language to formulate. I didn't have a way of engaging with people to share this, this question, this inquiry. So at the time I chose the Christianity of that particular culture. And when I was 13 years old, I was to be confirmed in the Lutheran church. Well, I was an absolute horror in the confirmation classes because I asked a lot of questions. And this one day the priest gave us the assignment to draw an image of how we see God. It's a very literal example of this temporal thought experiment that we're playing with here. Draw a picture of God, he asked a group of 13 year olds. By the way, how would you draw a picture of God? If you want, I think you should choose an emoji for God. Go on, put it in the comments, that'd be funny. How would you draw a picture of God? My peers, so there's a group of us, maybe there were, there's 10 of us perhaps. So my, my peers, I've got some great emojis coming in here. <laughs> a unicorn. <laughs> yep. I'm happy to worship the unicorn. <laughs> um, my peers drew various forms of that happy cartoon God with the beard and the angels with the harps. And that's beautiful. And I drew a mandala sort of a thing with, with one side very vibrant and flourishing and the other side withering in shadowed entropy. And the priest is walking around and he's looking over people's shoulders and he's like, oh, this is very nice. God is a very loving man, isn't he? And he came round my shoulder, went quiet. I felt this icy, icy essence between us. And all of a sudden, bang, he slams his fist down on the table. <laughs> Someone's put a little B as an emoji. He slams his fist down on the table. He says, how dare you blaspheme? But father, I said, if the snake was already in the garden, then the subtle frequencies of counterforce is already an idea in God's mind. And we are to navigate it, not fight it. It belongs in the mandala. And he kicked me out of the class. <laughs> so, no, no, you need to leave. So I was demonized, I was ostracized, I was rejected, I was denied by the one representing the infinite I am. That's why this was a traumatic moment for me. But I did feel like my point was proven. I was like, well, there you go, you're the priest in the house and you're kind of also the demon. <laughs> I actually got a message from this morning from Shishti, my best friend during that time, and she mentioned this episode remembering it after all those years, which prompted me to include it today. Isn't it lovely how that all works? The very literal example of how when we pour our understanding, or the, the yearning from our inner landscape into a creation, whether it is your business strategy or whether it is your ministry or whether it is the, the works that you're doing in court, you can pour all of your devotion and your essence in into that and it needn't be received by the world. So I share this in comfort if you're still wondering why your offering isn't landing in the world. Your work of art, that holy response to the yearning of your inner landscape, that voice of God as he moves through your hands, whether you're doing a crayon drawing of God or designing a new online course or putting together a case to present to court, that work has a specific timber, a tone or a note that certain others are attuned to. They can hear it, they recognize it, and a bond is created in their engagement with it. So they remember. These are the people that your artwork is for, that your business is for that your music is for. These are the people it's for. Not for the priest who wouldn't receive you through the filters of his theology. Because here I am, 
28 years later, asking the same question and formulating his response. My persistence and dedication over the years is holy devotion. That's long de devotion. And it transcends the doubters and the naysayers and the villains in my life. So look back. What has transcended all those years and all those chapters? What remains now like it was then? And don't just give an automatic response. Sure, we can name things like beauty and love and belonging. Investigate. Investigate that transcendental essence that remains all these years later through all those chapters of becoming. and share your discovery, type it in. It is very uniquely personal to you, but it may just strike a chord with someone and entangle them into that same inquiry. So in our thought experiment today, we have remembered, number one, that what you put your hands to in creativity becomes an article, an actual object of your devotion, holding the electromagnetic weight of the holiest call and response as a magnet in the fabric of the human experience, drawing more love to it and expanding love from within. Number two, it has a unique timber that belongs in the greater harmony of his plan. And it needn't be recognized by everyone equally, but it is nonetheless the most powerful medicine for the world. So keep going. And number three, Devotion isn't confined to higher realms of consciousness or upper dimensions of spiritual purity. It lives as comfortably in the high stress mayhem of Matt's restaurant kitchen, or even in my messy little kitchen at home. It's what's cooking that matters. And finally, devotion is a gift back into him and it is a sacred responsibility as a disciple of love as an apostle a herald of the everlasting devotion is a sacred responsibility so take this mastery into your heart and let it sink into your bones thank you very much for watching this teaching from the sovereign way I have been Elizabeth, you have been wonderful. And now I'm about to close the live stream and open our small group, The Oasis. But first, let me ask you, what did you take away from today? Just one thing, choose one nugget, the one that really struck a chord and formulate it as simply or as eloquently as you like and pop it in the comments because you never know who's yearning for his response. Thank you for watching. Let's go to the Oasis. Hello, my friends.